God has provided all that we need to know to please Him in the Bible. The story of the Lord's victory over death, the beginning of His church, and God's instructions for us are all held within the pages of His Holy Word. We've talked about the importance of God's Word, the relationship of sin and judgment, and the gospel plan of salvation. We become Christians by hearing and believing God's Word, repenting of our sins, confessing Jesus as Lord, and being baptized into His death. Then we are added by the Lord into His church. In order for a Christian to live pleasing to God, it is necessary for each one of us to continue to seek and obey the truth of God in the Bible, and to know how we must live and worship as members of the Lord's church. Once again, my name is John Hafner, and I'm here to help you by showing you what God has said. As we go through this study together, you will notice again how all our answers will come directly from the words of the Bible. You can read these verses for yourself as they appear on the screen, and you will be able to understand for yourself what God wants you to know. The first part of our study deals with the oneness of the church. We'll begin by examining what's go what God's Word has to say about the church. Read these words of Jesus with me. And I also say to you, that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Now our first question is this, how many churches did Jesus say he would build or establish? You'll notice in this verse Jesus says church, not churches, so our answer is one. God's Son established only one church. Okay, in the next verse, Jesus says this, Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Here our question is, since there is only one church built or planted by God, will all other churches be uprooted? Yes, that's right. The churches which are not the Lord's church will be uprooted or destroyed. Elsewhere in the New Testament, we find this verse. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. All right, how many bodies are there according to the Bible? There is one body. That's right. Notice another scripture on this topic. Describing Jesus, the Bible says this, And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. Okay, here we need to answer the question, what is the body? The body is the church. So we read in Ephesians that there is one body, and in Colossians that the body is the church. Therefore, there is one true church. Since Jesus is the head of his church, he has all authority. We shouldn't go to any other source to find the proper name, organization, or worship for his church. Other churches are unauthorized. Men can invent other churches, but those will not be accepted by God. Now, let's come to another Bible verse. I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another. But there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. All right, two questions here. First, how many true gospels are there? One, right. And we've already studied the importance of God's word. That is the unique message of Jesus and his teaching which all men must obey. 
Our second question is, what does the Bible say about a man or a church that would teach a different gospel? Looking at the verse, it says, let him be accursed. When Jesus prayed to his father, he said these words, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And our question here is this, did Jesus pray that his followers all be one? Yes, he did. Now, there's one more scripture we want to note in this part of our study. Now, I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. All right, now, does this verse teach that we should have division? No, it doesn't. Since religious division is against God's will, and Jesus prayed that all his followers would be one, should we work toward religious unity? Yes, absolutely. Can't you see the only way for us all to be united and speak the same thing is to only use God's word without adding to it or taking away from it. If we want to find and to be the church that belongs to Jesus, then we must look to his word as our only standard of authority. In the next part of our study, we want to discuss the importance and organization of the church. We will discover from God's word that Christ's church is important, and he has given a design for its leadership. First, notice this verse from the New Testament praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. And here we ask the question, who was adding these individuals to the church? Well, based on what the verse says, it was the Lord. That is, Jesus was adding to his church. Another question we should ask here, who is it that the Lord is adding to his church? Well, it says, those who are being saved. So, if the Lord adds those who are being saved to his church, then are there any saved people outside of his church? No, there's not. The ones who will be saved are the ones who are in Christ's church. Okay, let's come to another verse. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. And our question is this, what did the Lord use to purchase his church. Jesus bought his church with his own blood. This references his sacrificial death on the cross. And we could pair this verse with another in the New Testament. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. All right, when we put these ideas together, we see something important. Why was the blood of Jesus shed? Well, based on this verse, we know it was for the remission of sins. Therefore, if we want our sins to be remitted, that is to be forgiven, then it's required that we would be in his church. Elsewhere in the Bible, we find this verse and that he might reconcile them both to God 
in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And here's our next question. People are reconciled or brought back to God in what? They are reconciled to God in one body. That's right. And we've already seen that the body is the church. Do you see that those who are not in the church are not reconciled to God? They are separated from him. All right, let's look at another verse together. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Jesus loved the church and did what for it? He gave himself for the church. Again, we're talking about his death on the cross. Now, based on the price that was paid in giving his blood, would you say the church is important to Jesus? Yes, of course it is. Should it be important to us to be a member of his one true church? Yes, absolutely. The Bible also reveals God's design for the organization of his church. Notice what's said in this scripture. So when they had appointed elders in every church and prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Here our question is, what was appointed for each congregation of the church? That's right, elders. Elders are overseers. Their job is to watch for the spiritual well-being of members of the church. We will see from the Bible the requirements one must meet in order to be an elder and how these men serve the Son of God in their role. Next, notice what was said to the elders of the church in Ephesus. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Now we ask the question, what were these elders or overseers supposed to do for the church of God? You can see here that the elders were to shepherd the church. Very good. Shepherds watch out for their flock of sheep, guide them, and provide for their needs. They defend them from danger. And the New Testament also tells us what is needed for one to be a qualified elder or overseer. Let's notice this next verse. This is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop, then, must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Bishop is a word that means overseer. It's another term for an elder. Now, based on reading these verses, must an elder be married? Yes, we saw that in the verse. Do elders have to be men? Yes, they do. It is the husband of one wife. Must an elder have children. 
Yes, we saw that as well. May a new Christian or a novice serve as an elder? No, at least not yet. He needs to take time to mature and develop. And elders need to live faithful lives, exhibiting self-control, hospitality, gentleness, and purity. We also read of another role in the Lord's design for His church. Deacons are servants that work under the direction of the elders in a congregation. Notice the following verses. Likewise, deacons must be reverent, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy for money, holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. But let these also first be tested, and then let them serve as deacons, being found blameless. Likewise, their wives must be reverent, not slanderers, temperate, faithful in all things. Let deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own houses well. For those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. Do we find that God has specific requirements one must meet to serve as a deacon as well? Yes, God has revealed what he wants for the organization of his church. So would we be pleasing to God if we had elders and deacons which did not meet these qualifications? No. That's right, that would not be pleasing to God. One last scripture for this section of our study. It comes from the start of Paul's letter to the church in Philippi. Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, with the bishops and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, and we have two questions here. First, to whom is Paul writing this letter? The Bible says to saints in Christ Jesus. As we've seen from our study together, those who are in Christ are in his body, the church. According to the Bible, members of the Lord's church are called saints. This is a word that means set apart, made holy. And our second question, this scripture tells us that the church in Philippi was organized with what and what? With elders and deacons. That's right. They were following God's plan for leadership in his church. The next part of our study deals with the worship of the church. And in this portion, we want to learn how God instructs the church to worship him. We'll begin with this verse. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Question. Must we worship God in spirit and in truth? Yes, exactly. And we pair this with another verse out of John. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. To sanctify means to set apart or make holy. So our question is, what is truth? Well, in this verse, Jesus is praying to God the Father, and he says, your word is truth. So our answer would be, God's word is truth. Since we must worship God in truth, must we worship as God has directed in the Bible? Yes, absolutely. When we follow the directions of the Bible, we are following God's word. Let's come to another verse together. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines, the commandments of men. 
Is it possible to worship God in vain? Yes, it is. He says, in vain they worship me. If we worship God according to the commandments of uninspired men, will God accept our worship? No, he won't. God does not accept man's doctrines. Look at another verse with me. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Did Jesus command his disciples to partake of the bread and the cup? Yes, the Lord commanded that they take the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is a memorial of the suffering and death of Jesus on the cross, representing both his body and his blood. It is made up of unleavened bread and the cup, which was the fruit of the vine or simply grape juice. Let's see another verse describing the Lord's Supper. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? Okay, our first question here. The cup is a communion of the blank of Christ. And what goes in the blank? Well, based on this verse, the answer is the blood of Christ. The fruit of the vine is symbolic of Christ's blood shed on the cross. And our second question, the bread is a communion of the blank of Christ. And our answer for this blank, the body of Christ. That's right. The unleavened bread represents the body of Christ. We have communion or fellowship when we share these items as God has directed his church to do. Let's come to another verse together. Now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. Okay, and our first question here is, when did these Christians meet to eat the Lord's Supper? Well, we can see from this verse, the answer is, on the first day of the week. And our second question, should Christians today eat the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week? Yes. Let's come to another verse. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in prayers. All right, now looking at this verse, can you name four things the New Testament Christians continued in? Yeah, you can see them right there, can't you? They continued in the Apostles' Doctrine, Fellowship, Breaking of Bread, and Prayers. So, will we be pleasing to God if we continue steadfastly in these things? Yes. Now, let's look at another verse on this topic. Now, concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also. On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. Question from this verse. Is it God's will that we give as we have been prospered? Yes, it is. Second question. Are we to make a monetary contribution on the same day we are to partake of the Lord's Supper? 
Yes, on the first day of the week. Very good. Now, let's look at another passage. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. And our first question here is, does God want us to sing in worship? Yes, he does. And the second question, where do we make melody to the Lord according to this verse? We sing and make melody in our hearts. That is, we must focus on the words of truth that we are singing. We must mean what we are singing. Now, let's notice something about the attitude of those who worship God. Jesus said, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Now this verse tells us to put what first? We must seek first the kingdom. As we've seen from our study, the Lord's kingdom is his church. The work we do for the church should be the most important thing in our lives. All right, let's look at another verse on this idea. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Okay, our first question here, I want you to fill in the blank. It is wrong to blank the assembling of ourselves together. Forsake, that's right. If we are putting Christ and his church first in our lives, then we will not abandon our fellow Christians. As we've seen, Christians meet on the first day of every week to take the Lord's Supper, sing praises to God, give an offering, pray, and continue in the truth of God's Word. Choosing not to attend worship when we could be there is not pleasing to God and is not good for our church family. All right, we have one more verse reference for this part of our study. For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, If anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. Now, do you think God would be pleased if we were to add to or take away from his word? No, of course not. So then, is it important to worship God the way he has commanded without alteration? Yes, it is. We do not get to decide what is acceptable in worship. God has revealed what he wants. The next part of our study deals with the name of the church. And in this portion, we want to see what God's word teaches about the name of Christ's church. First, notice the words of Jesus presented here. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Here our question is, Who built the church? Well, since it is Jesus speaking in this verse, our answer would be Jesus built the church. And to be very clear here, we also need to ask this question. Jesus said he was going to build whose church? Jesus said, I will build my church. The church built by Jesus is the church that belongs 
to Jesus. Now, let's look at another verse. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Okay, who purchased the church? God purchased the church. We see that in the verse, and we can be even more specific because the verse says, with his own blood. God's Son purchased his church through his sacrifice on the cross. Now, seeing who built, purchased, and died for the church, whose name do you think the church should wear? The church should wear the name of Jesus Christ. Of course, that's right. Next, we will see how mankind sometimes has a problem doing that. Now, I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Okay, looking at these verses, would it be wrong to name the church after Paul, Apollos, Cephas, or any other human being? Yes, it would be wrong. And if the church were named after Paul, whom would we be glorifying? Paul, exactly. So we can see when it comes to the name of the church, the people belonging to Christ should be called by his name. Members of the church are called Christians. We should not say we are of some man. We are the Lord's. Notice another verse with me. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. The question from this verse is, are we to do all in the name of the Lord Jesus? Yes, we can plainly see that answer from this verse. Secondly, would this include the name by which we refer to God's people? Yes, the church must do all in Christ's name or by his authority. Elsewhere in the Bible, we find this verse. Greet one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ greet you. Okay, do you read of the church of Christ in the Bible? Yes, we see it in this verse. And would it be wrong to call the church by this name? No, it wouldn't. And one last question here. Would this name glorify the one who built, purchased, and died for the church? Yes, Church of Christ is a biblical, descriptive name for the people belonging to God's Son. Now you understand that the Lord's Church is the kingdom, and how it is vitally important that we submit to his authority. To overcome our great enemy, we must trust in God and obey the word of truth which he has revealed for us. Let's review what we've learned together in this study. Looking into the Bible, we saw that God's Son established only one church. Christ has built his church and we must be added by the Lord to his church 
in order to go to heaven. We also saw the importance placed on the church in the Bible. God has given specific instruction concerning how his church is to be organized and how his church will worship him. We saw the need for bringing glory to Christ rather than to some man. Members of the church belonging to Christ should wear his name. We honor God's Son and fight against our enemy, the devil, as we consistently serve and worship Jesus based on the teaching of his holy word. It's important for you to remember that God loves you and desires the very best for you. Thank you for going through this study with me. If you would like help finding the Lord's Church in your area, or if you have any questions regarding what you've just learned, please email your questions to help at wvbs.org. May God bless you.